Hello and welcome to Preprints in Motion. Join us as we sit down with early career researchers and discuss their latest preprint and find out about their journey through the muddy marshes of academia. But we don't stop there. Every month we'll be bringing you special episodes with open science leaders where we discuss how to fix academia. Easy, right? So hit that subscribe button, leave a rating, or find us on Twitter at MotionPod. But for now, let's get into the show. Today we learn how to extract DNA from very old, very precious samples with Erica McAllister and Petra Korlovic. Uh, I'm a bit nervous for this one because Eric, Eric, has, Eric has done real BBC programs. We're very amateurish <laughs> compared compared to that. So thank you so much for, for coming on to the show. And I, I think actually there's a good start. It t- turns out, by coincidence, that the three people involved in the podcast are all big fly people. Uh, we all did our PhDs on uh, fruit flies. So there's a weird coincidence. Or maybe not. Maybe that's what, what drew us to your work. Or basically all good people are fly people. Oh, yeah, well, they're the best people in science. I've never met a better bunch of people. Yeah. Yeah. It's, some, it's Working with flies, it must just be relaxing. Or maybe it's all the flies you eat as you work with them that manage to escape the CO2 pads. <laughs> So, so, so we've got two guests again today. This is our second recording in one day. So I think as a start, it would be good if you introduced yourself so people can, can recognise your voice a little bit. Um, yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Petra and I'm a postdoc at the Wellcome Genome Campus. Sort of specialised my PhD during my PhD in working with really old DNA. Back then it was ancient uh, fossil bones and teeth. And then I started doing my, uh, my postdoc in the Welcome Genome Campus, uh, switching to historic mosquitoes. And that's how I got in contact with Erica and how we started discussing about doing DNA extra- minimally morphologically destructive DNA extractions of historic flies. How, how, how old is old? For us, old is, I would say, up to a century. Um, oh. That's some of the oldest samples in the Natural History Museum collection. Flies weren't as popular. Of course, there's beetle and butterfly samples that are older than that, but flies specific. I think Erica will know what's the oldest, oldest fly in the museum. The oldest fly in the museum is current, so um, not extinct fly. They're 1680. Oh, that's quite old. Uh, And they've been recorded from Hamilton Court. It's basically our, our earliest geographically referenced specimens out because it was the head gardener for the queen. And so he kept them in a book. And as he was a botanist, he kept them as he would a plant. So they are morphologically a little flatter than they would actually be in normal life. But they are still perfect. Their colour is perfect. Do, do you think we could refluff them or it's a bit too optimistic? Oh, I mean, we're good at fluffing. Petra and I are really good at fluffing. But I think even I, I would be a little bit hesitant to muck around with these little boys and girls. So Erica, do you want to introduce your background a little bit? Because you you work at the Natural History Museum, which is super cool. It is very, very cool. But right now I'm coming to you live from the shed, um, which is my back garden. Um, Although I have a little bit of the collection here, so don't tell my bosses. But um, yeah, I'm one of the curators. I'm a senior curator of Flies and Fleas. And I've been working at the museum, I think, for about 15 years now. Which in museum terms, I'm basically a teenager now. I've finally moved on from being a toddler. And I'm quite obsessed by the flies and the collection. And we have arguably the most comprehensive collection of flies in the world. And this is in terms of geographical spread, in terms of historic distributions. Mosquitoes are quite an important group of flies. And it's been something we've been, everyone's been studying for a long, long time. And why the Natural History Museum is such a a wealth of biological diversity and our heritage is it's got the most type specimens of these groups. So a type specimen is the name bearing specimen. So we have this arguably for all animals and plants. We don't have it for a human, though, because when Linnaeus, the grandfather of this naming system, um, set it up, we were going to use his body. Turns out his body was a bit shoddy (laughs) so (laughs) we didn't do it and we still haven't got anyone because we've been arguing ever since about that but basically for most other things we have those types and so when people go out and describe new species and and i'm trying to understand the biota of the planet they will use us as a reference collection so it's really important so i i live in london and i was at the natural history museum not that long ago actually 
Uh, I'm currently working. I'm working my way around them all. Yeah, well, when the pandemic's over, you can come behind the scenes and have a little look at the collection. Oh, John's going to be. Oh, look at your jealous. faces! All of you just <laughs> went. Oh, hello. I'm coming down to visit that weekend, Johnny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you you can't even imagine how fun it is to spend uh, an hour digging through. What is this box? Oh, let's open it. <laughs> Wait, Peter and I got sidetracked. Do you remember the monkey blood brains or whatever? I remember the monkey yeah. blood slides, yes. Monkey blood slides, which we thought would be the best like band name we could possibly ever come up <laughs> we, we were just like, what on earth are these monkey blood slides? And after was... after like an hour and you look at your hands, they're full of some grey stuff. <laughs> this box is full of malaria or some other parasite slides. Yeah. Basically blood yeah. slides. You're just thinking to yourself, hmm. Maybe I should decontaminate myself before I exit this <laughs> this room. You know, we the best we get is rummaging through a minus eighty from like a professor who's been there for sixty plus years, and you you find samples from like the nineteen fifties that can't possibly be of any use anymore. They're all of use, and that's why we we we're, we're concerned about this, and why one of the reasons I think why we wanted to do this project to show you that a lot of those cruddy stuff is actually still really relevant nowadays. So well, yeah, so so your 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 preprint was developing a method to extract DNA from very old, very old samples. And of course, part of the problem with extracting DNA is it's generally quite damaging to whatever it is you're extracting it from. And I suspect you probably don't want to do that to some very old, valuable museum specimen. Somebody's <laughs> probably going to be quite angry with you if you do that. That person is me. <laughs> yeah. So when Petra just bans about the word destructive, it does give me vibes. <laughs> it is something that museum, she's giggling, but she knows, you can hear my tone. My tone is quite irate about this because obviously these are very important specimens. And even every specimen is important because they represent a moment in time. You know, when you lot, you lot, you... <laughs> You sequence in people, you come along and you're like, can I just remove all the legs? I'm like, no, <laughs> no. And it's it's all very well with a big mammal, such as a whale, and you only have to take a tiny bit. But when we're talking about specimens that are in the millimetres, you know, and, and your techniques are a bit dodgy, <laughs> uh, I'm a bit like, nope. Do you, do you miss that one leg? Just the one leg? Is that, that no, I know they've got six, but <laughs> these are all old. And many of them, as Petra would tell you, lost a lot of legs along the way as well. They, yeah, they, they lost a lot of legs during uh, the last couple of decades. A few got decapitated. Um, yeah. So some samples, that they don't preserve as well as we would hope. Yeah. It's, it's just been, I think, recently that people realize mosquitoes should probably be preserved glued to the side of a small piece of paper and then on a pin and not just impaled <laughs> on a giant pin <laughs> for decades because that destroys all of the connective muscles and it's just well time to lose pieces left and right yeah there are some specimens the only thing that's holding them together is this thing called verdigris which is a reaction of the pin with the lipids in the mosquito so we got rid of this this substance. That's it. Our whole specimen is just falling apart, which Petra had to deal with quite a bit with some of our specimens. So, so is, is this a situation where there's a lot? You know, when, when I get in trouble, I get the full name treatment. So, is that something Petra has maybe experienced? See, luckily Petra does me little drawings, so um, <laughs> she's very, very good at those, and she knows my weaknesses, and therefore, and and is doing such a good job that I've occasionally tutted or raised an eyebrow, but she has been very, we, very... We have found the symbiosis <laughs> over here, yes, yes. yes. And it's not, you know, this publication did not happen overnight. We've been working together <laughs> on testing and, and modifying for quite a while. And I did realise that some specimens would probably have to be sacrificed for the greater good of our, our understanding. So what what is that method you, you've come up with? Could you give us a brief sort of overview of of the method you've developed because it does end up with a nice amount of dna coming out without destroying the samples which is what we all want yeah so I mean, of course as any other project we started by going through existing literature and seeing what others have done and a large number of papers that were talking about non-destructive insect dna extractions were done on beetles uh, which are very sturdy, have very thick cuticles, and in general can withstand way more than a tiny mosquito. So we went for the papers that dealt with flies, some of them that were 
dope with mosquitoes, some dope with uh, fruit flies. Basically just looking, oh, this paper uses this buffer, that paper uses that buffer. And so I took some of those buffers, simplified them, and then we started testing them on, on primarily we started with Anopheles or malaria transmitting mosquitoes because we are doing a whole bunch of projects on them. So the idea was, well, we really want to know what happened there in the last 100 years because it's a very, very re present day researched group. So we know that there's quite a lot of changes and live populations living there today, primarily a very, very high rise in insecticide resistance. So we wanted to see, well, how far back in time can we track this? We know insecticides only really started in the 40s. So that's why we started selecting the Anopheles mosquito samples. And then slowly we were, oh, well, th those are kind of the worst flies you could work on, <laughs> being fully honest, because they're some of the smallest mosquitoes with some of the longest legs. And this is why in, in the manuscript, we also uh, talk about two other groups of mosquitoes, Aedes and Culex, and we talk about Tetsi flies, which are absolutely perfect. If you want to do historic flies, you should definitely focus <laughs> on Tetsi flies. They don't care whatever buffer we extracted them with, uh, time. They look perfect. We actually even, if you look at the pictures before and after, they look better after extraction because we cleaned all of the dust that accumulated on them over the last few decades. It's interesting because with the, with the morphology, this is what we want to be able to ensure that we can still identify them after they've gone through this procedure. So beetles and ants, as uh, uh, Petra says, they've got a really hardened, really sclerotized elytra. So they're just like robust. And how you identify a lot of these are because of their certain um, patterns or shapes which don't deform. Flies, oh, flies don't make life easy for anyone. Now, no. I love them, but they are a bit of a nightmare at times. And no one is going to disagree with me on this one. Nope. And mosquitoes, well, mosquitoes, what can we say? So, yes, they've got those long legs, but they've also, you identify them from patterns of scales and their thorax. You've got hairs on their abdomens. You've got different shapes of hairs on their head, how their paps are banded, blah, blah, blah. And so it's basically what we call a nightmare. So the idea is to be able to not only extract enough DNA, but not, not get rid of these really key features, which, you know, we're hoping were there. And fly people, I don't know, well, you've listened to me a lot. You know that we're slightly obsessed with certain physical features and so rather obsessed by what happens to the genitalia i know you're giggling but you know i do fly fiddle a lot and um this is one of the things that we need for identifications now these nematoceros these very primitive flies as it were evolutionary primitive there are some external parts of the genitalia but there's also internal parts now when, when you look at these previous papers yeah, the external features of beetles are like, yeah, I'm hardcore. But their their internal bits, all gone. And it's like, oh, we can't do that. Not with flies, really. And as you are all uh, Drosophila holics, as it were, you will understand how important it is to make sure we retain these features. So inside and out, we wanted to develop a technique to enable us to really see what's going on. I think it's safe to say we, we're all fly fiddlers here. Yeah. Is this a fly fiddlers anonymous? This, this, it is. <laughs> so, so one of the um, one of the, the steps in your method, and I'm very jealous you came up with this. So you put your samples in a, a sort of a box to rehydrate them. And this is something we did during my PhD. So one of the methods we had to do was to put cells in what we called a humidified chamber. So it was just a plastic box with some wet paper towels on the bottom. Uh, you called it a fly sauna. Why, why did I not come up with that? that? What a good name for it. That is so much better than humidified box. Well, we, we came up with quite a lot of pretty good terms during this whole, this whole project. Um, I think it came from basically when I started this the whole extraction procedure, I thought I could just put a mosquito in a tube with lysis buffer because it was so dry, the static electricity basically destroyed it. So I, I stopped the experiment at that point and actually went to insect blog posts um, that mostly deal with butterflies and other insects. And then I was reading up on how they deal because they have to collect stuff on the field and then it probably dries a bit by the time they're 
ready to prep them. And they actually had, yeah, food containers full of just cotton balls with water and not even a micro, just like on their windowsill uh, to rehydrate them. Uh, and it basically, at some point, really just looks like fly spy. You just have these insects sitting there at, let's say, 30, 35 degrees in a nice uh, moisture fill environment. <laughs> And at one point, I took a photo of our flies in, and that's in the Twitter thread of our flies in a box, pinned, nicely rehydrating. And I jokingly sent it around to my group, calling it the fly spot. People were very upset because that was during, I think, second lockdown. So they couldn't go to the spa, but the flies could. The, the flies often have it better than we do. They have a much better life. And I think this must be an insect person thing because anyone in the fly community will know we have the best gene naming ever. So we were mentioning our obsession with fly genitalia. Uh, we've got Ken and Barbie uh, as yeah. genes that are associated with fly genitalia. Uh, they're just all so good. I'm kind of jealous we don't get to do that with the, the mammalian stuff. I got to interview Stephanie Moore and she did um, First in Fly, her book. And um, we were just giggling our heads off about the inappropriate gene names. <laughs> and um, I, I cheap date. It's, cheap date is a great like, one. <laughs> yeah, I know. And it's like, gosh, it really is. And um, it's just, you can see, you can see how we've just got bored with so many genes. And it's like, let's go for it. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you can see the difficulty a clinician might have if they were in a clinic describing that to a patient and calling the patient just cheap date. <laughs> You're a cheap date. <laughs> so, so, I mean, we've already touched upon how important these, these these specimens are. But as you say, some of these early attempts when you're trying to optimize these kind of procedures are quite damaging and you're going to you're gonna lose some specimens. How did you choose which specimens to prioritize early on? I, I mean, did you pick ones that were already maybe a bit tatty and kind of half specimens? Or, or did you just go for it with the really good stuff? No, 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 we didn't. So... The collection we think is approximately 1.2 million specimens that are pinned. Uh, we have 100 and, uh, 500 drawers of pinned material, just to get your head around. The key top 10, as we call them, the top 10 vectors, we um, have representatives in the, basically in the Anopheles gambii and the Anopheles finestus group. We had representatives for nearly all of the the species within that group. And then we were like, okay, so we look back, we digitized them first. So we got somebody to go through um, absolute specimen level data, all of this. So this is a, a big step in its own right. And that took quite a while for individuals to go through it without damaging it, because I did threaten anything they broke off the specimen, I would break off them. <laughs> so it does, does kind of hone your instincts to be very good about that sort of thing. So straight away, we can start to actually look at the data associated with specimens. And this is what Petra was very good at. She went through, she's like, okay, you've got a cluster of 30 that have been caught in the same year from the same place. This is where we should pick them from. And then I would go back in the collection and I would look at the sex of these mosquitoes and I'd say, okay, hold on. And we wanted to predominantly work with the females. But then there's also sorts of exciting things for later date that we want to save is that a lot of them still are blood fed mosquitoes. So these were caught in the field. So who knows what we could actually find mm. from their stomach contents. So I we were specifically trying not to pick blood fed mosquitoes to start with. So there was a lot of to and fro and to and fro and to see what was going on. And yes, we did sacrifice some of the most deformed looking individuals to start with. Though we do have one of the larger sets in the manuscript is also on lab-reared mosquitoes. They are lab-reared mosquitoes from the 40s. So if you look at their mitochondrial genetic diversity, they're still quite diverse. So I don't think it was what we would say lab colony, very narrow genetically. Mm. It was probably catch, put in box, mm. put in lab. So, I mean, that, that digitalization effort must be quite a good resource as well, right? That must be incredibly useful well this is yeah no this is the museum is doing a full-on thing at the moment is trying to digitize our collection which is a way of repatriating all the biological data so we pay for the storage but we get absolutely every bit of information out there and one of the things that this project hopefully we're going to leap on is we have a huge collection of mosquitoes but think about how many other collections around the world have this if we start to digitize all these collections 
you have such a wealth of data to be able to start understanding more and more about how these populations have changed, how they've migrated and things like that. So yes, it's, it's a big thing that we as the museum are trying to do across. I worked out my, my present rate, <laughs> it would take me 300 years. So luckily they've developed high throughput digitization processes because, um, yep, I'm not the fastest. You don't want to. You don't want to spend the next three hundred years doing it. Oh, I, I'm. I'm happy doing that. I might have to stop doing podcasts. But... <laughs> so, so I mean, when you're doing this, um, how much genetic material remains after you've taken your samples? Is is this something you could go back to the same sample and take more DNA if you need to in the future? Uh, we haven't really tried this with the old samples. I had to, I'd not even thought about that. Yeah, but that's because we tried that actually with modern day samples where it's samples from our insectary. And so Erica doesn't doesn't need to see us putting metal beads in the tube <laughs> and then vortexing until we <laughs> homogenize the tissues. Gonna go sit in close the close somewhere. your ears. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have we've tested basically we also switched this slightly less destructive but still non-destructive approach for the modern samples it's just we're not as cautious with them we don't put them in single tubes they are in plates but all parts of the mosquito even though it, the legs typically fall off are in the same well and you can go back to it and look at it and this whole approach even for the present day samples did start because of this historic samples and talking to erica because she was so adamant that morphology is important and we should probably preserve it down the line so we were oh let's also try this on the modern samples see if it works and it works great this is not a preprint it's a paper that was published a month or two ago where we basically can screen thousands of uh, malaria mosquitoes for their species and if or if not they have an active uh, plasmodium so malaria parasite infection going on in them and the dna extraction price is 0 0.09 pounds per sample <laughs> That does not account for PCR, but still. And you're left with a plate of mosquitoes that are now in ethanol, and you can go back and look at them. And so just to see, we went back, browned them up, and tried to extract whatever was left. And it's typically not much. That, okay, it depends from sample to sample. For some, there's still 50% of the DNA there, but for some, there's only like 10% left. So we do tend to get most of it in the first non-destructive go. I imagine that would be worse with all the samples too, right? I assume there's probably less starting material. Dep I mean, does that change depending on how the sample was preserved? Yeah, it will do. Yeah, there, it's, there's less starting material because the DNA degrades. Um, this is a completely different, of course, the DNA is going to look completely different in a freshly caught, even if it's dried, if it's a two year dried uh, mosquito that has been sitting at room temperature, the DNA is still of much better quality than for a pin sample from the 50s, because it's had basically 70 years to further degrade. Um, even though the good thing is, typically, these samples have been stored in a collection of sorts from the moment they were pinned. And collections tend to have very, very non-fluctuating humidity and temperature. And that is the main DNA killer. So the moment you have fluctuating temperatures and more air moisture, the DNA starts degrading faster. Interestingly enough, the DNA length we get from some of these samples, like from the 20s and 30s, is comparable um, to 40,000 year old Neanderthal bones. <laughs> but yeah, again, uh, DNA preservation in a bone is completely di different than DNA preservation in a in a arthropod. So, so John John might want to come in and ask this question because so John's background is in his PhD was in in insecticide uh, resistance and coming with new ways of tackling that. So maybe he wants to come in to ask ask the next question. Yeah, I can do. So yeah, I yeah my PhD was on RNA interference insecticides, so kind of bioinsecticides, but now I'm working on kind of tradition as it was sort of traditional insecticide resistance in mosquitoes. So that's that's why I'm obviously very very interested uh, in this work. Um, so yeah, what one of the sort of tests you kind of did once you'd got all the kind of sequence data was to look at 
some of these kind of key polymorphisms that are associated with insecticide resistance. So you, you were looking at the, the voltage-gated sodium channel, I think, which is a, a, the target for a lot of you know, perithroid insecticides, DDT and things. Um, so maybe you could just, just give us a bit of a kind of overview as to how, you know, kind of what what, what the data captured um, and what it kind of showed about that and insecticide resistance. Yeah, so the, the voltage-gated sodium channel gene is one of the main target genes, I think, in across all I don't even know if it's just insects, arthropods in general, but it is one where some of the major uh, insecticides and some of the white, most widespread insecticides target. And so it's the easiest one. The moment when you have a mutation, you don't die from the insecticide, and so you can spread the, the resistance further. Malaria mosquitoes tend to be even more fun because they like to hybridize, which means populations can spread resistance faster, but that's another thing. So yeah, basically we do have, we do present lower coverage data, except for samples that were on the younger scale. So from the 80s do have quite a bit of coverage compared to the really old ones from the, the 20s. And we just looked at known insecticide resistance variants in populations across sub-Saharan Africa that we know from, to, uh, we know from uh, present day population uh, structure studies are resistant mutations are identified in this region, which are likely the cause of uh, the resistance. And so even in the low coverage data, I just went and I looked at the variants that we find in the old samples and low coverage, but still we see nothing. We don't see an emergence of, of resistance variants in even in the samples of, from the 80s. It all looks insecticide susceptible. Although, again, we have a large chunk of samples that are pre-50s when widespread insecticide use started in sub-Saharan Africa. So for, as a continuation of this project, we now actually have more samples from the 50s, 60s, and 70s uh, that we are sequencing and we want to look at and see if now we can start seeing a rise in insecticide resistance alleles. I mean, is there, are, there, are there other samples around the museum you, you kind of have in mind of things you'd like to use this technique on or potentially beyond museums so I'm, this could this potentially have use in uh things like old murder cases where there's samples that you maybe you don't want to destroy the actual sample you just want to take some dna out of could you guys be the people who solve jack the ripper finally oh, that'd be quite nice wouldn't it are there are there <laughs> entomological parts of those because they they have sequence materials probably not We've got we've got the maggots in front of um, on my desk at work that were the first forensic case in the UK. It would be quite interesting because again, uh, morphology of maggots is quite difficult. So where where you have got morphologically challenging specimens, woohoo, diptera, um, these sorts of things would be quite good. And the idea is to open up the collections for this sort of research. So, as I said, most of our extant collection goes back to 1680. So you can imagine you're doing all sorts of amazing stuff and, and, and looking back at those sorts of things. And this is useful not just for vectors, but historic DNA of the gut contents of, of different pollinators. So not only can we incriminate what's pollinating now, we can look back and see how this has changed. And we can see whether the different insects are moving from one flower to another. And has this been something because of our agro ecosystems? So suddenly you've got what people just wrote off as loads of dead specimens and useful for one or two people, suddenly becoming a very vibrant collection that we can start asking all sorts of new and novel questions from. So there's lots of really exciting stuff to come then. Yeah, just give us some money, we'll do it. <laughs> uh, but also since we don't destroy the morphology, for example, even in our set, we pre-selected samples that we thought were a certain species, and then we found two that turned out to be a completely different species based on mitochondria. And now we are able to go back to the sample and actually look at it and be like, oh yeah, there was a mistake. I mean, and this is really interesting stuff. Sorry, I'm getting so excited, Petra. Because then we can look back in collections all over the world and we can say, hold on, what we thought was one species there wasn't. So this really helps in epidemiology. This really helps when it comes to health control programs and all of these sorts of things. So if we practice with a lot of specimens here, bring the price down, thanks to Petra and Mara's work, and then start looking at these collections around the world, you've suddenly got a wealth of information that would be just brilliant. This is really cool. 
Or can I just squeeze one in? Go on, John. So we sort of mentioned earlier about you saying other kind of insect orders and things like beetles, for example, are kind of like a lot sturdier specimens and you can do a lot more with them. But so I guess I wanted to ask the question. Yeah, physically. physically. (laughs) I guess you want to kind of flip the question around and say, well, just because you're using quite like a sort of gentle lysis buffer and things here, does this method work as well on insect orders that are, you know, built a bit more robustly, have slightly kind of thicker exoskeleton and things? We haven't tried this on non-flies. So we have tried this on malaise catch um, samples, which are still mostly flies. There might be a wasp here and there. And there is a person from my group that has done a lot of work on hoverflies, which are nice and chunky and sturdy, but they're still flies. There's no reason to look at anything else. Besides flies. I, I don't, un- <laughs> don't understand this question. But I mean, we looked at the tetsy flies. Yeah. They are. Yeah. I mean, anyone who's ever been, had the proboscis of a tetsy penetrate the skin will quite happily testify at how robust and chunky these organisms are. Uh, we, we, we have a tetsy fly colony in the basement at LSTM, so I can, uh, for, for the podcast, I can volunteer to go down there and uh, get Yay! bitten and I'll report back to you as to, uh, as to how it feels. If you want to film that, that would be great to stick on YouTube <laughs> of you just being bitten by a bunch of flies. That would be great. I, 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 any sacrifice for science in the podcast, you know. <laughs> Where do I find out about the different bioarchived licenses? This CC, BY, CDXY nonsense is driving me nuts. Hey, that Bio have a resource for that? Ugh, that's your answer to everything. That's because they have everything you need to know about preprints. Sure, they probably have the basics, like info on the preprint servers, but what else is there? There's so much more. Looking to post a preprint, but not sure what different journal policies are? They have a collection to help you out with that. There are meetings around preprints and associated services. If you want to know how preprint adoption has changed over time, there's even a page on that. And COVID? They have a big section on preprints and the pandemic, plus some really cool infographics for communicating preprints. And university policies? Surely they don't have that. They collect uni policies where possible. Okay, okay, they do sound pretty impressive, but is it not a bit of an echo chamber? It can be, but ASAP Bio also engage with people who don't love preprints and have concerns. So we had an excellent discussion on this very topic a couple of months ago. Oh, is there anything ASAP Bio don't do? Honestly, no, they're so nice over there. They were so quick to jump in and support this show. It's your one-stop shop for info on preprints and open science initiatives. So head over to asapbio.org to learn more and subscribe to their newsletter for the latest in preprint news. If you want a deeper dive into the world of preprints, then look out for the next recruitment of ASAP Bio Fellows. So at the, t- the, the kind of, it's given away in the title of the podcast, um, but we focus on preprints. And so we, we like to ask questions about your sort of experience behind preprinting, why you did it, that kind of stuff. So whose decision was it to preprint and why did you choose to preprint rather than go straight to submitting and publishing? Well, I, I do like the trend because it does get science moving at a bit faster pace, especially since in my experience, it's it's been getting more and more difficult in terms of length uh, getting a paper out and these are results that you present at conferences so people start asking about the methods start asking about uh, well did you try this did you try that what worked what didn't and for the past pretty much when we since we started this protocol i had my own protocols and then if a collaborator or someone heard about this at the conference i would just send them like here's the google doc Uh, here is this here is that so that was one of the big reasons it was we talked quite a bit of this recently the method is ready we would like people to start looking into it and using it and i already had people on twitter ask me about oh we're working on bees do you think we can use this on bees can we try and replicate this so i would say it was a great decision because now it actually reached more people that are inclined to try it out and then yeah while it is in uh, active review and then the final product might have I hope we don't have to sequence more but might uh, might have slight uh, slight differences <laughs> sequencing always takes too long I feel like <laughs> the whole scientific process takes too long oh yeah but it is it's very interesting because it's something we are desperately trying to move on to get more out of our collections and understand it and everybody is trying different angles and the more methodology we get out there the better it is to make an informed decision 
and you've got to remember us mm. lowly curators a lot of us are not on the um forefront of sequencing so it's not something we do so the more information we can get out the more informed voice we can about what is best for the collections in the long run is the most helpful way of doing it so having these preprints and things like that generates a lot of discussion why we chose specimens why we do that and so it, it is a very interesting way of doing it yeah that's something we've had a few people mention is saying you know, the, the feedback you get from putting your work out there and putting it out there that in a way that everyone can actually read and, and access yeah people are more likely to make a comment because it's not done and dusted mm. so they still think that they've got a voice of course we don't listen to them no i didn't say that <laughs> No, I just wanted to say, I don't know if it's because I wasn't on Twitter before, but since I made a Twitter thread of the, the preprint and I was talking a little bit less uh, formally about it, the Twitter thread got more traction than my actual two published papers from my yeah, PhD. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is the whole thing again, is, is we have to communicate our science better and we have to show the relevance of our science, not just for our funding, but also why we do this. And so a Petra's Twitter feed and things like that and presenting the science in a, in a non-scientific form was an absolutely, it was just a winner. It's just superb. <laughs> having having little comic drawings of mosquitoes ah, helps as well. Yeah, I've got so many of Petra's little drawings everywhere. This is why you must pick your collaborators very well. And um, she's an <laughs> awesome drawer. One, ones that provide drawings or food, yeah. I find. Food is always always a winner. Bake me brownies if you want to work with me and you're in. <laughs> so, I mean, we, we, we Twitter comes up a lot on this show when we're talking to people. And I swear Twitter really need to start giving us some money because the amount of free advertising we're giving to the people who actually listen is just insane. Um, but it, it, it has really helped move along the dissemination of science and just that, that conversation and getting it out there. And yeah, I, I think I've got a few Twitter threads that have more attention than that some some actual papers have had um, which i think is a good thing though you know people are engaging and think that ultimately is the, the goal of science right yeah it's, because it's... i mean who no offense to your papers and i'm sure they're wonderful i'm sure they're eloquent yeah. and they've discussed but the average person would probably not come across that so twitter mm. opens up this field it stops us being exclusive amongst the scientific community and puts us into the broader audience you know i don't think of basically anyone that's ever going to read my PhD thesis, apart from the two people, three people, four people who are forced to read it. <laughs> so it's it suddenly you're learning how to communicate and you're, you're learning again how to explain the relevance of your science. And I think this is a lovely thing and it, it cuts away a lot of the crap <laughs> because mm. you're suddenly focusing what really is important and flies of what's important. <laughs> so... I mean, talking about sort of communicating science, you're both quite prolific science communicators. Uh, as I've mentioned quite a few times now, Petra does a lot of drawing and Erica has been on the BBC and does a lot of you, you best-selling author. You know, you, you're really deep into the sci-com side of things. So, I mean, how do you find that as an experience? Is that, Obviously, you must enjoy it, but how does that balance with the sort of day-to-day -day work? <laughs> oh, do you want to start, Petra, as I cry into my wine glass? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have a wine glass so I I s actually started doing a lot of uh, public engagement even before I was in science as a high school student I would help out at a local astronomical observatory um, that my dad is the head of and there would just be like popular talks about astronomy and we would put out a telescope to look at the moon and people of all walks of life and all kinds of background knowledge would come and so you would have to know how to explain the moon to a five-year-old and a 95-year-old so i did start pretty early and i did realize i i like that i liked having to challenge myself to explain science in a very different way and just last week well not last week but a few weeks ago, I had a series of, of talks for, um, I think it was primarily aimed at high school students um, or people that just started university on what it's like to extract DNA. The person before me was talking about present day samples and extracting whole chromosomes uh, and just like the perfect conditions followed by me being, <laughs> okay, so we have this 100 year old mosquito, there's nothing left. 
also if if you destroy a leg the curators are gonna find you and so again you have to switch switch your talk although they did ruin ruin my punchline in the next talk because it it was about are mosquitoes deadly or misunderstood and the first slide was do you think mosquitoes should be exterminated and 80 percent of them immediately said no because these are people that understand biodiversity <laughs> I'm like damn you ruined my next 30 minutes i thought it was gonna be 20 and then by the end 80 or okay it was more than 90 by the end so i did change a few minds yeah i i think science com is very very important um we have to justify having 80 million specimens hidden from the public view we have to justify why you need 1.2 million mosquitoes. Don't we just want to get rid of them? We also have to tell you about the biota of the planet. So um, uh, most people in the UK live in urban environments and their interactions with a lot of the natural world is quite limited. But even in just telling you what's going on in urban environments, why should we care about malaria in London? And why, why should you be putting all this money into things that are just completely to you, maybe not important? So in communicating, actually, this is a technique that's not just helpful for us to incriminate mosquitoes and malaria and understand what's going on. We can use it for all sorts of other things. So it's been able to look at the bigger picture to explain why science is really amazing and our world is worth saving. And I'm quite mm. selfish and I quite like being here. So as long as we can do that, I'm quite happy about that. I think most of us quite like being here. I mean, I, I know Erica completely ruined me after I started working with her because normally I would see a mosquito on a wall. I would try and squash it. And now I, I see a mosquito and I'm like, do you, do you want some food? Do you want some some sugary water? Do you want my arm? What would you like today? And they see no one goes around just swatting puppies, do they? No. <laughs> And that's basically is trying to get people to look at mosquitoes as animals and to change that term from mosquitoes being described as the deadliest animal. They're not. They have been manipulated and used. Females have been used for thousands of years. I'm just saying I'm going to go on a feminist rant about, again, a female has been manipulated. The boys, they don't care. They're all vegetarian, doing their own stuff. The poor mothers are being manipulated by the plasmodium the filariasis and everything else just trying to just destroy her reputation and um no no you carry on because i just rant <laughs> <laughs> i was going to say we've got a uh, we've got a cartoon from a newspaper stuck on uh, one of the fridges in the lab um and it's got a picture of a male mosquito coming home with like his overcoat on to his wife and taking his hat off and saying something about oh that's such a hard day's work biting people and someone has obviously scribbled on it it's only the females that bite <laughs> I know. but this is this is also very interesting is how much what when i do science communication and talk about it how much the public don't know how much we have become so absorbed in our subject and we talk to our peers and even when we talk to our peers we realize they don't know things just think about how much has been lost in communicating and um it's been interesting during this time of the pandemic so that people are beginning to understand what sequencing means and, and really start to begin to understand mm. that. And it's like, this is something we need to heavily get through to people. Why we do this? This is, there's a real first, you know, there's a massive world issue that we're solving through this sequencing. Let's extrapolate it and use it for other things. I'm, a, I'm an immunologist and it has been crazy to be sitting on the tube hearing just the general <laughs> public have in-depth conversations about antibodies and all the really technical immunology side of it and what's going on. It's just mind-blowing. It's great because I think that certainly at the start of the pandemic, there was this notion amongst certain scientists that the general public wouldn't understand any of this, which is rubbish. That shows just how bad we get in our sort of ivory yeah. towers. And it's just so nice to have so many people actually engage with science. And yeah. I think now is that if there was ever a time to jump on that communication train and really try and push that, now must it's got to be it now right well the nerds are loved we are we are appreciated <laughs> group of people and um, we've got to take our nerd and, and, and use it for the greater good so i mean do you do you guys have any tips for good sci-com because it is it's not necessarily an easy thing to do um we know our subjects that's probably the only thing petra knows her subject in she can talk for hours you think i can talk you get petra on it and i'm like i have no idea what this woman is going on about anymore <laughs> 
it's very very good yeah you need to put me you need to put me in front of a board though because i will try and scribble things yeah but that's the whole thing is is knowing your subject and and both but both petra and i i think you we're quite passionate about our subjects as well and um you can't fake yeah. that mm. you know? and 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 you can hear it when you see people present they superficially get the subject but the ones who you know who are really good are the ones who spent their time to thoroughly get into all the nooks and crannies of understanding their subject. Yeah, there's many a science talk where I just fall asleep because the person's not passionate about what they think, what they're talking about. And that just, it ruins it for me. I need that that passion, that energy of, I love what I'm doing. Let me tell you about it. As, as long as you let me tell you about it. that That's the highlight of my day when that happens. We have many tax offs, as it were. So it's who can talk about the best organism. <laughs> So that kind of hones your your skills because it's like, oh, oh, you think that beetle's good, do you? <laughs> I'm going to raise you ten flies, and so yeah, we're quite competitive. Although I do find I do find it a bit easier. I don't. It's just what I'm used to talking to people in public because then you can see their reactions and be like, oh, this is not clicking with them. Let me switch my wording. Let me switch how I talk about things. Or my favorite is, oh, I don't have to use very serious jargon. <laughs> We're going to talk about the fly spa now. I would put the fly sauna in my papers. That I would use that if I was still doing fly work. No, we don't, we don't call it like that. In the we, 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 we did a paper, basically, where we blow dried mosquitoes. <laughs> I mean, you know... We are meant to be respected scientists. Uh, basically, <laughs> turned into people who stuck them in a blow dryer. And, and that's a very important piece of research we did. And I think there in it is that we can see the humour of what we do. And um, you communicate the humour and it sticks in because you're giggling about a fly sauna and a blow dryer, which yeah. really you lot are adults and you just, like, <laughs> just grow up. We're, we're, we're definitely not adults here. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think we've grown up outside of childhood. I think we stopped. I mean, the moment the moment I posted the preprint, um, and uh, Mara, uh, the last author on the paper, was like, "You should make a Twitter thread on it to get to get some traction." I'm just over here rubbing my hands, being like, "I'm gonna draw a fly, a, a mosquito, and then I'm gonna put cucumbers on her eyes because she's at the spa." <laughs> so. <laughs> That, that's why it took me three hours to make the thread, to Twitter thread because I was here just thinking how can I make this sillier yeah so I, slightly selfish question because this is something I would love to, like a dream thing to do but how do you get involved with doing stuff for the BBC like how do you take your sitcom to the next level oh, they came to me so <laughs> <laughs> yeah I was like oh okay yeah would I like to do a series hmm. think about it what yeah, I have to talk about flies. Uh, well, um, I guess it's because um, the combination of knowledge and humour, mm. and that's that's basically what it is. It's, it's being able to co communicate. Just if you listen to me interviewing these people, these people are legends. I'm interviewing top scientists from around the world and things like that, and this is like wow. Like you did this, and and it's just there's that there is that inner child, isn't it, that you mm -hmm. don't lose. I've never lost it. I've realised that physically I'm sagging, but emotionally I'm still that four year old that's going. Can I jump in that paddle? And can I put the flea under a microscope? That's amazing. And so the the BBC <laughs> like that apparently. So that was quite nice. And I've worked. Um, I did a few school gigs with uh, Brian Cox. And uh, so he would go around and he's an amazing guy. He turns out he is really amazing. So um, what's her love? Maggie, who does the sky at night. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Okay. So there it was Brian Cox, Maggie and myself. And I'm like, really? You've got an astrophysicist. You've got another amazing woman who's looking at the universe. And then you've got me talking about flies. And I realized at that point, you have to kind of bring out the big guns. So mm. yeah, every weird fly fact. I was there, I was going to find it and I was going to deploy it. And so, yeah, he was, he was very good and he's very encouraging. You get passed around once you start. Mm. It's like, oh. Johnny Vegas goes, oh, you're my favorite entomologist. I'm going to ask you anything. And I'm like, oh, I'm an entomologist <laughs> to the stars. Who thought that would happen when you were a little person looking at a maggot? I, I, I think, you know, it's, it's, Psychom so important and I think it is really cool to just get out there and, and do it. I think, you know, I mean, we, we tend to focus on the early career researchers for this, this podcast. So I don't very often get to talk to, to big 
names and, and get a sort of fanboy out like that. But even just the early researchers, it's, I think talking to anyone with passion is just, it's so much fun. And that inner child, that is what makes a good scientist. You, you need okay, to be a you child. you put it together. You put Petra, Mara, who's like the senior researcher, and my in a room. And oh, the conversations are, I mean, they're science, but they're done in such a silly way. And I think that was a really, really nice thing. Because also, it means you weren't embarrassed to say something. You were encouraged. You are developed. And, you know, there was lots of hand-holding along the way because oh, this is a new um, foray for me into the sequencing and things like that. And, and Petra's, uh, you know, is still although amazing and still quite young in, in in terms of her career. And then you've got Mara, who's more developed. So lots of holding hands and, and bringing different parts in. And that and there was no embarrassment of going, OK, look, I don't know what you're talking mm. about, because they would help you along in the process. And that was so rewarding to be part of. Yeah, it, it's amazing when you're in the, the kind of the right atmosphere, surround yourself with the best people. It's just, you can't beat it. That, I think, is why, that's why I'm still in science. And for me, it's just, it was also ex extremely fun because I keep switching. I like evolutionary ecology. I've been doing that for a while, but I just keep switching organisms, sequencing methods. I went from hybridizing green frogs and Sanger sequencing to Illumina ancient DNA sequencing on a couple hundred thousand year old samples. And now I'm talking to fly people, I'm like, this is all very cool. And at some point, maybe I even get to work on spiders, but that's for a future. I just really like spiders. Yeah, but you still love flies the most, Petra. This is very important for our future collaboration. I do like, I very much like flies, yes. However, spiders do eat flies. Yes. And some spiders, <laughs> flies eat spiders. So we need to talk, we need to discuss. But Petra and I have also, we were, I also spent time in London school, like researching a lot of the people who did the research. Mm. And so again, it developed our other passions and hopefully we're gonna get something out of that. So you're looking at all these names of people who collected it. So again, this is another way of looking at the collections and how, how they come alive. You've suddenly got yeah. the people behind it. So you Liverpool school and London school, you know, you've got, <laughs> you're the forefront of so much of the research that was leading to this. And, and we're looking at Leeson, who collected all of these mosquitoes. I mean, he's, he's like a daddy of a mosquito in, in the vector world and things like that. It's, it's really, it's quite fun. We spent hours going through these. We were basically let loose. In the archives. <laughs> London School archives. Here, here are the six box from Leeson. Most are from this expedition in 1936. And you're just there digging through field notes of Leeson's assistant who was sitting there just like putting little ticks. Okay, yes, this is Finestus. This is Finestus, but with this wing type. And you're just digging through these old lab mm. material, not lab materials, field materials. There are a few lab things too. You have manuscripts that were handwritten because someone then had to sit down and actually type the finished manuscript on a typewriter. It was so much fun. Eric even found the menu from one of the train rides. Yeah. And it's just like, they become real. Mm. You said, I mean, I've done so much field work and, and, and half the fun of the field work is all the nonsense that goes with it. And suddenly you're realizing we've just looked at that as, say, Anopheles Finestas or whatever I collected here. And now suddenly we're with them collecting. Mm. We understand the effort a hundred years ago or whatever to go and collect these mosquitoes and what it must have been like. And there's a video of them, a film of them taking off from Croydon Airport in, and, and the journey they had to go to Southern Africa to do this and how they were met. And it's, it's absolutely fascinating to have a look back. I, I, my favourite bit is always the story behind the science. It's always the best bit. It was good fun. My favourite part was I was actually showing a still from the video where they have the ladle collecting mosquito larvae. And then Mara shows up. I was like, oh, yeah, here is us doing the same thing. <laughs> 90 years later yes. but with buckets and so it's people collecting the looking in a bucket <laughs> looking for larvae in there it's very true we really haven't improved our methodology at all have we i use a hoover now um but that's about it well not for the larvae no nope. so I, I i this this could conversation could go on for hours but I, I think john and emma will shout at me if i keep it going on for too long so so unless, unless... i'm having a whale of a time you know i don't know <laughs> Unless, unless, Ali, unless you two have anything to add, I think that is a good stopping point. Well, I, I'm going to add one more thing, yeah. is that all of you researchers, 
think about these collections that are hidden. Mm. So the NHM is a very important collection. But at Liverpool, you've got the World Museum. It's an amazing collection. Everywhere has got all these collections. Start looking about that because they add depth to so much research and they're really, really useful. And just bring your new and novel ways and talk to the people there and find out what we can extrapolate from these long dead specimens. Yes, so cool. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming along. This I I've loved this chat. It's been great. Definitely. As I say, when the museum, when we're allowed to let you lot back in behind the scenes, you're more than welcome to come and have a look and stimulate some further ideas. I'm actually talking to a woman tomorrow who wants to swab hydrocarbons off a lot of these specimens to do sorts of things. So it, it, people are are beginning to do all sorts of nice mm. and novel stuff. It is it's, it's a wonderful thing. Do come. It must be it must be amazing to get people who are like at the forefront of sequencing and coming in and, and looking at these things in a totally new way. It's it's all sorts because it's not just sequencing. So it's imaging in a different way. So you know it's just suddenly that one specimen. It it is now so many people can ask different questions from it, and that's. That's really quite fun. Hmm. So when I'm in the garden and I look at a fly and I think about this fly and I think about how it is living. And as I came from an ecology side, I, I think about the interactions. But then I know that even after death, there's so much we can ask about it. This is really quite, you know, it really makes me feel totally inadequate as a human. <laughs> that, that one little blue bottle or mosquito in the garden offers more wealth than I do. Well, that, I think... That that is the perfect ending note. I think that, <laughs> right? That is that's the last thing we want in this episode. We're all <laughs> inadequate. Yeah, and be nice to your little flies in the garden. Okay, thank you so much for coming on. Okay, and that is the show. If you enjoyed listening, then hit that subscribe button for more, and leave us a review on whatever platform it is you're listening on. You can reach out to us on Twitter at MotionPod or online at preprintsandmotion.com. Didn't enjoy that? Well, we're all scientists here, so send us your review and let us know what works or what you'd like to hear more of, or less of. But until next time, have a good week. <laughs>